Welcome to Cosmic Calendar, a new video series where we explore upcoming celestial events and we walk through how to best capture and view those events. Today we'll be starting with the double Galilean moon transit of Jupiter. And this is where Europa and Ganymede, two of Jupiter's larger moons, will cross the front face of Jupiter at the same time, casting shadows behind them. So let's dive in and talk about where this is visible, when it's happening, and how to capture it. So this event will be mostly visible from the US west coast out to about Hawaii. And you will be able to see some of the event as far east as the US east coast, and as far west as the Australian east coast. So anywhere between the east coast of Australia and the east coast of America will be able to see at least part of this event. And if you're right in the middle, then you should be able to see most, if not all of it. This is a sped up visualization of this event happening. And there are two main parts to this event. Firstly, the shadows will cross the face of Jupiter. This will then be followed shortly after by the two moons, Ganymede and Europa, crossing the face. It's going to start on the 28th of May at 7 a.m. UTC for the shadows, 10.30 a.m. UTC for the moons, and finish at about 2 p.m. UTC when the moons will finally finish crossing the face. I will also show up on the side here those local conversions into... PDT and Australian time. So now that we know what's happening, how do we take images of it? Well, firstly, you're gonna need a telescope for this one, preferably one with a reasonably high focal length. I'm gonna be using my 190 Mac Newt for this one, which has a thousand millimeter focal length and is usually an F5.3. But we're gonna need a bit more power. So there's a couple ways where you can boost your focal length to a different effective focal length. And the easiest of these is to use a Barlow or a PowerMate. Now, Barlow and PowerMates achieve the same things, just in slightly different ways. But for this exercise, we can think of them as the same. Barlows usually start at a two times Barlow, and that doubles the effective focal length of your telescope. So in my case, I would go from a 1,000 millimeter focal length to a 2,000 millimeter focal length. Now, this is fantastic, but it does come at a cost. And the cost is while you double the focal length, you have a quarter of the brightness that you originally had. So things start looking fainter. Luckily for us, planets and especially Jupiter is very bright in the sky. So we can sacrifice a bit of that brightness to get some extra zoom or magnification on the planet. The second step that you can take to increase your effective focal length is to use a smaller sensor. Now, if you're using a full frame sensor, then your crop factor is one. And that means if you have a 1000 millimeter focal length telescope and you put a full frame sensor on it, you get a thousand millimeter focal length in the camera. But if you have a crop sensor or a smaller sensor, like say a micro four thirds, then your focal length will actually increase. For a crop sensor, it's usually around 1.5 times. And for a micro four thirds sensor, it's about two times. So I have a micro four third sensor. I usually use this one here, the ASI 294MC Pro. And uh, so this is about a two times crop factor. And so that means if I used this one, I would have a 2000 millimeter focal length. And if I used this in conjunction with, uh, this is the Teleview two times power mate. So this is a doubler, like a two times Barlow. Then these two together, I would have a 4000 millimeter focal length which is starting to get somewhere. And you can probably see the details of this event with about 4,000 millimeter focal length, but really you want more again. Uh, in this case, more is almost always better. So instead I will be using an even smaller sensor. This is my guide camera. This is the ASI 290 mm mini. And it has a very small sensor. It is a one third of an inch sensor. And because the sensor is so small, it gives me a crop factor of 6.5, which means my 1000 millimeter focal length telescope is now six and a half thousand millimeter focal length. If I then attach the two times PowerMate or Barlow, I am now up to around 13,000 millimeter focal length. And that starts to give us about what we want to see, to see these very small moons cross in front of Jupiter, which 
you know, Jupiter's still a long way away. It's up over sort of 600, 700 million kilometers away from us at the moment. So now that you have your focal length sorted out, the next thing is we wanna be taking videos. Uh, videos allow us to capture a large number of images in a short amount of time. We can then use a process called lucky imaging in our editing to take the best frames or the best part of any frame out of that video and combine them together to get the crispest image we can. And this is because when you're imaging planets, you're looking through a lot of atmosphere and you're using really short exposure times. So sometimes an exposure gets blurred out because of some of the atmospheric distortion or part of the image might be blurred, but the other part might be crisp. So this allows us to get around some of the atmospheric seeing issues that you can see when imaging at short exposure lengths. This is gonna be especially prevalent for me. I'm based in Sydney and Jupiter is gonna be very low on the horizon. In fact, it's only gonna be rising uh, after the moons have already started to have their shadow pass across Jupiter. So I'm gonna be looking through about as much atmosphere as you can, and I'm gonna need all the luck I can get to take th th these photos. So since we're gonna be taking videos, that means we're gonna be taking lots of frames as quickly as we can. And the next thing we're gonna talk about is exposure lengths. And when you're shooting planets, you wanna keep your exposure lengths really short. Planets surprisingly move a lot and very quickly. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn both rotate very quickly. In fact, Jupiter rotates in just under 10 hours. So in five hours, it actually will completely cross its face from one side to the other. For imaging this event, I recommend keeping your exposures under 100 milliseconds, which is a tenth of a second if you're using like a DSLR uh, or some sort of mirrorless camera. You can then use your gain or ISO to make sure that your exposure is correct and your histogram it you know, sits nicely in the middle there. Uh, you definitely don't want to overexpose these images. Um, so make sure that all the detail in the planet is captured. Um, and that will mean that the background of space is very dark and you won't be getting any stars, probably uh, not even some background moons, but that's okay because we only care about the bright front moons and Jupiter's body itself. So make sure that you're exposing correctly here. So when I use this camera, uh, its default is about 20 frames per second. And that's not bad. Um, you know, 20 frames per second is a lot, um, but you can actually increase the amount of frames per second that you get out of your camera if you have a, a camera like this or a dedicated astronomy camera. Or well, sometimes even modern DSLRs and mirrorless cameras allow you to change this by reducing the resolution. Uh, luckily, planets are very small, even in such an extreme focal length, and I'm gonna be stopping down the resolution of this camera from its native, uh, native resolution, which is about 2000 pixels across, down to something like 640 by 480. And that'll allow me to go from 20 frames per second standard up to about 140 frames per second. Now, 140 frames per second is really good, but unfortunately that won't work at 100 millisecond exposure time there is simply not enough time in a second to fit 140, 100 millisecond images into one second. So we're gonna have to go even faster. Now, if you're wanting to capture 20 frames per second, then you're gonna need at maximum 50 millisecond exposure time. And if you're wanting to capture 140 frames a second like I am, then I'm gonna have to stop this one down to seven milliseconds. And I'm definitely gonna be using a lot of gain to increase that. So there's definitely a compromise here. But why am I trying to shoot at such an insane frame rate? Well, firstly, the more images you capture, the more likely you are to capture a frame that is really detailed and doesn't have atmospheric distortion washing across it. Secondly, because Jupiter rotates so fast and it's quite close to us compared to some of the other planets, and we can see a lot of that surface detail, you actually can't image for very long before Jupiter's rotation starts to impact the quality of the image. So ideally you wanna keep your video sessions below two or three minutes each. And after about two or three minutes, stop the video, start it again, and then you can capture a second lot of images. And what this will allow you to do is uh, for each sort of degree or so of rotation that Jupiter makes, you can capture an image. This is great for a couple of reasons. 
Firstly, after you capture all your videos, you can then run through a process uh, that I use, which is auto stack it. And this will combine all those two or so minute video files into a single frame. You then have a number of these frames and you can create a time-lapse video, which shows the rotation of Jupiter over maybe the half an hour image session that you had. Secondly, it's good because if you have lots of these images that were taken from two minute videos close to each other, then you can actually use another piece of software, which I will link down in the description, which actually allows you to de-rotate some images. So we can combine a couple of these images, which do have slight rotational issues with them together without losing the detail that would have happened if we'd captured one really long sequence and tried to add those details together in auto stack it. Auto stack it simply isn't designed to compensate for planetary rotation. So that's pretty much it. You want to keep your exposures as short as you can, get that focal length as long as you can, and keep your video sessions quick. It's better to have multiple short videos than one really long video. One last thing I will touch on is if you're using a Barlow or a PowerMate like this, many of these come with through screds on the end. And because the camera that I'm using is going to be a monochrome camera, this actually allows me to attach some red, green, and blue filters to my image train without needing a filter wheel. So this will actually allow me to capture a full color image of Jupiter with a monochrome camera. So if you, like I, am using your monochrome guide camera for this, then you may also be able to take a full color image of it by buying some RGB filters and attaching them to your Barlow or Palmate. I hope you've enjoyed this video series. Would love to hear any feedback you have and I look forward to making the next one.